All right, everybody, thank you for being with us today here at Football Fridays at the Eck, presented by Guinness. My name is Chris Palmquist on behalf of the entire Notre Dame Alumni Association. Welcome back to campus. Our next guest here on the Football Friday stage really requires no introduction at all, but I'm going to try anyway. A true Notre Dame legend, the 1987 Heisman Trophy winner, a nine-time Pro Bowler, a college football and NFL Hall of Famer. Help me welcome from the class of 1988, Tim Brown. So, Tim, we're so excited to have you here. Thanks it's for being with us. Can you uh, hear me? Oh, there we go. Okay. This is your second time back on campus this fall. I know you were here a couple weeks ago for Purdue with the Holtz's Heroes guys. Well, actually, third time. My first time was to bring my son, Timmy Jr., here. For He's at the uh, over at Holy Cross. So um, uh, we'll have him in the, in, the, in, the, in the gold and blue in a minute. But uh, right now, he's over at Holy Cross. But uh, So we brought him up here in, in August. So. So that has to be the highlight of it. <laughs> right. of the time. <laughs> but the, the Purdue weekend with the Holtus Heroes guys, yeah. you guys do so much to reconnect, and you raise some money for Meals with Muffet, our, our nationwide food drive. What's it like when that, that whole crew gets back together? You know, it's always great. You know, um, of course, I, I'm one of the old guys when you, when you get to talk about Lou Holtz's uh, players here because uh, I was one of the first classes uh, that he graduated. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm the older st uh, statesman when, when we all get together. But it's always great. You know, these guys are doing such great things in life. And um, just to hear what they're doing and to see what they're trying to do with, uh, with the university and with Holtz's Heroes is always a beautiful thing. Every time we have somebody from that era who played for Coach Holtz, we always have to ask. Everyone has a Coach Holtz story, so what's yours? Uh, you know, my story is that after two days of being in spring spring ball, after we had gone through winter ball, 5 a.m. practices, by the way. Um, you know, after the second practice, he pulled me over and said, okay, kid, tell me the story. And I was like, coach, what are you talking about? You tell me the story right now. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Why didn't they play you? I said, coach, they just didn't play me. You tell me the story. Was it drugs? Was it women? Was it grades? You tell me the story right now. I said, Coach, they, they just didn't play me. I said, you know, my freshman year, you know, I fumbled the first time I touched the ball, and, and they just didn't think that I was ready to play big-time ball. There's no coaching staff in America dumb enough not to play you. You tell me the real story. <laughs> and uh, so we went through that uh, for a while. And uh, after two days, he told me uh, that, that uh, during that conversation that he thought I could be the best player in the country. And, and I told him, I said, look, you got the wrong guy. I mean, my mom and daddy told me to come up and get an education and go back home, and that's what I'm going to do, and that's what I'm here to do. And uh, he said, well, you can have both. And I had never really thought about that. I mean, I thought about getting this education and going back home, working, doing those things. And uh, for the first time, I thought about, wow, not necessarily playing in the NFL, but, you know, giving football a little bit more importance, and, and that led to me being the Heisman Trophy winner. Yeah, that's right. That the most recent Heisman Trophy winner. I'm not going to say last because <laughs> right, right, right. just most recent. Now, yes. for, for most of us here, we would point toward that 87 season or your, your more than 5,000 all-purpose yards, which is still a Notre Dame record. Are those the sort of things that you think of first when you think back of your time on South Bend, or is it something else? You know, it just so happened that I'm, I'm doing this uh, tomorrow morning. I'm going to be filming a documentary, Heisman to the Hall, and um, – uh, there's only 10 guys who win the Heisman and in the Hall of Fame. And, um, you know, one of the things that they talked about is we don't necessarily want to go to the football spots. We want to talk about your life on campus and, and what you were thinking during these times. And, and so for me, you know, when I think about my time here, I don't necessarily think about the things that happen across the street because everybody knows about those things, right? Those things are very public, and you can pull them up on Google whenever you want. But it was really my time on campus and in the dorm rooms with, with, with people who didn't know anything about football. And, you know, one of my best friends from ND is, um, you know, first-generation uh, Chinese guy, Tony Lee. You know, I still talk to him almost every week. So, um, you know, so the people who I met are, are, is really what I would like to talk about, when, uh, the, the things I think about when I come back here. And, uh, you know, I... I I got 15 guys on, on a text. Uh, we call ourselves Bond, Brothers of Notre Dame. We talk every day. So I, I, I get that every day. But when I'm back on campus, 
the things I think about. And I always say this every time I come. I don't know why. Man, things sure have changed. You know, <laughs> I mean, it seems like by now I'll be used to that. But uh, I always find myself, I said it to my son today. He's like, man, that, you know, things, <laughs> it just wasn't like this when I was here, you know. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, football is football. But I, I think Donald Dame is much more than football. And, and those are the things I love to talk about. Your class helped set the stage for the 88 National Championship. Of course, you were a little busy catching passes in L.A. for the Raiders at that point when that happened. What's that feeling like with a bunch of guys that you played with, a bunch of guys that you practiced with for, for three years, four years, the, to watch them go out and win a national championship? You know, in Coach Holtz's first meeting with the team, he said that we're going to win a championship in three years. So the juniors and the seniors are going, one, two, you know, we short, we short a year. Some of us two years, you know, and I think from that standpoint, it was a buy-in session for us. And basically what he was saying is, we, we don't win that championship if you guys don't buy in. If the upperclassmen don't buy in, we don't win the championship. So, uh, you know, so for us, man, you know, uh, we, we just said, look, I mean, we had two pretty tough years with, with Faust my first two years here. And now we have this guy who said that he can get it done, but the only way it's going to happen is we got to, you know, as juniors and seniors, we have to buy into the program. And uh, that's what we tried to do. I mean, we tried to do whatever he asked us to do. And, you know, first year didn't go that great. Second year was a lot better. Third year they won a national championship, man. I, I was happy, sad, you know what I mean? You know, because uh, certainly would have liked to, to be a part of that championship team. Uh, but at the same time, knowing that you had something to do with it, um, you know, make, make you feel pretty good about yourself. Between Coach Holt saying you were going to be the best player in the country and that they were going to win a national championship in the third season, are we sure, like, can he get us the Powerball numbers tomorrow <laughs> right, too or right, something? Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, look, this guy, man, you know, had the ability to make you think, you know, yes, there's a brick wall there, but you can run through it. I guarantee you, if you think hard enough and you believe hard enough, you can run through it. And he used to do this thing with us where he would have us to lay out on the floor. And, you know, a lot of us came here. We had one suit, you know what I mean? And that's a suit we wore every, every, every away game. But he would have us to lie on the floor in the cafeteria, wherever we were, and stretch our arms out. And he would do this thing, man, where he started your toes and, you know, you, you, you can't move your leg now and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, your arms, if somebody tried to hand you $100, you couldn't. And you find yourself going, man, I really can't move. What's going on? What's going on here? But then he would start talking about the first play of the game. It's going to be this. Tim Brown, it's going to be a kickoff. The ball is going to go to the right corner. We got a middle return on. How are you going to, are you going to get back to the middle? And have you to mentally think about this thing, uh, you know, before you ever do it. And that's something that my 17 years in the NFL, I did every game before because all we always had, for the most part, the, the top 15 plays. So in my head, I was able to go mentally lay down and just, you know. So I, I think when you, when you have a guy who has the ability to, to touch players' hearts and at the same time, um, I don't want to say control their minds, but get their minds going in the direction where they need, need to go, uh, you're going to have a very successful coach. You mentioned your time in the pros, and I want to leave some time for audience questions here in a little bit too, so be, be thinking of those for Tim here. After your time here at Notre Dame, you played in the NFL for a long time. You were the sixth overall pick in the draft, a nine-time Pro Bowler, the all-decade team in the Should've 90s. Should have been 11, but we won't talk about that. But <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Hall of Fame inductee in 2015. When you think back over those years in the NFL, what stands out to you? Consistency. You know, just the ability. You know, I tore my knee up, had major reconstruction surgery, medial collateral, posterior cruciate. Um, doctor, the Raiders doctor came to me and said, Tim, this is a really bad injury. Your posterior cruciate didn't just uh, tear off the bone. It exploded. So we're having to take your hamstring down and wrap it around just to give it. So he's like, look, you may have three, four years in the league, you know, so enjoy it. But you went to the right school. He literally told me this, you know, and I can remember that night when I was having surgery. I had uh, I wasn't married at the time, but I had my um, my class ring on and I can remember kissing my class ring before I went into surgery because I knew if I'd never played football again, I had a chance in life. And, uh, you know, I, I just think from that standpoint, man, you know, you get in a situation like that, um, you know, you try and go out and do what you can do. So I, I was thinking every time I went on the field, it could be my last play. And, uh, you know, I played 15 years. 
I missed one game that I could have played in in 15 years. So, um, but uh, that consistency, I think, is something that I'm always proud of because, um, you know, getting up, going to work every day is a good trait to have. And uh, the ability to, to uh, do that in the NFL uh, with all the bumps and bruises you go through is, is, uh, is a really good trait to have. You retired from the NFL in 04. You were inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2015. What's Tim Brown been doing since, since his professional career ended? Uh, you know, I, I did about seven years of television, ESPN, Fox Sports News, and um, one day I was, I had finished uh, a SEC, SEC game. It was a great football game, and I was walking around with uh, a sour puts face on, and, and the producer looked at me and went, what's the problem? I said, this is not me. I mean, I love this. I love the game. I love talking about the game, but I didn't help anybody today. You know what I mean? I didn't help myself. I didn't help anybody, and I just don't know if this is something I want to do going forward. And I asked my agent, I said, now, we're making pretty good money here. Can we do this hustling? <laughs> he was like, yes, we can. We can go speak at engagements and all that. And, you know, for me, it was, uh, uh, it was easier for me to do that than to, you know, spend three and a half days because, you know, we got to be there Thursday, Friday, you know, Saturday's a game, and then you don't fly to Sunday. And that was a lot. You know, I've been – I've given up a lot of time with my family for years – and now here I am giving up more time being away from them, and I just didn't think that was something I needed to be doing. Uh, but recently here, uh, about four years ago, I started an uh, oil and gas uh, transportation and supply company. So, so we're moving fuel for uh, Delta and UPS and got deals on the table with AT&T and Chevron and uh, our partners are Exxon and you know Chevron and Marathon and people of that nature. So... Uh, so that's what I'm doing now, man, having a great time doing it. And um, it's pretty pretty strange you know, to walk in a room and people look at you like, what are you doing here? You know what I mean? And, uh, and that, that's both good and bad that that's happening. But at the same time, it's an incredible opportunity. Um, uh, I, I got to tell you this real quick. This is how this happened. I'm on a golf course with a guy who's in the oil and gas industry, and I guess he was waiting to tell me this all day. And he finally on 18 Green, on 18 Fairway told me, look, man, you know, you need to check into this because there's a big problem in the in oil and gas industry uh, with a lack of minorities and uh, take a look. And when I look, in 2016, there was not one minority company that could do anything as far as uh, moving fuel for companies. And I thought that was egregious, if nothing else. Uh, but then when I got into business, I understood why. <laughs> because uh, it is a, a good old boys network, without a doubt. And uh, But look, you know, we have friends in high places that... Um, we pushed through some things that maybe other people couldn't have, and uh, has us in a pretty good position right now. So, okay. we got a few minutes here for some questions from the audience. If you have any for Tim, raise your hand. Joanne will come Ooh, around with has, the microphone. She rose her hand too quick. I don't know if I want this question. <laughs> she was ready. <laughs> I'm just wondering if uh, Coach Holtz ever shared any of his infamous magic tricks with your teams. Oh, all, all the time. I mean, that's uh, the, 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 the newspaper, tearing the newspaper and all that stuff, yeah. I mean, it was great for recruits. He would bring these recruits in and, and uh, freak them out with all his magic tricks. Yeah, it was pretty remarkable that he, he, you know, we still can't figure out how he does this stuff, but, you know, we know, we know the paper has to be put together. But how do you rip it up and put it back together like that? I don't know. But uh, I'm still a little miffed by that, I think. Tell me a little bit about uh, what bookstore basketball meant to you. I remember seeing <laughs> you playing the courts back here. <laughs> uh, you know, I can't, I can't tell you what my name was on bookstore basketball. I, I cannot believe that the university allowed us to have the name that we had. Uh, but, uh, well, I know that, that my senior year they made us, you know, modify our name a little bit. Uh, but, look, bookstore, I mean, look, we, we talked about bookstore basketball from day one of being on the campus. When I heard about it and knew about it, because I thought I was a basketball player, not a football player. I was very disappointed that Notre Dame gave me a, a, a football off offer, but I didn't get, get a basketball offer. But I was like, I can do both. Let, let me do both. But they had me to talk to Digger like they were going to allow me to play. But, of course, that, that never happened. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Blitzer basketball is great, man. You know, to bring in guys from, um, you know, from – from other dorms and, you know, guys who are not athletes and play together. It was a great time. And winning it my junior year was, uh, was a big highlight, no doubt about it. Thanks. 
Uh, back here, Tim. Yes. I uh, want to thank you. Uh, my friend John Daniels Jr. in Milwaukee gave me a signed copy of your book, Making of a Man. Oh, and well. it's, it's, okay. a, it's a wonderful memoir. And I'm just curious, what, sh what made you choose to share your star story in that way? Uh, and what were you hoping to accomplish, and have you accomplished it? Yeah, you know, I, I think, um, you know, having a Heisman and, you know, having such a, you know, great uh, football career, I think people, when you speak, think that uh, that's your life, and that's what it's all about. But for me, um, this journey has been about faith. Uh, it's been about my faith. You know, I, I can... You know, when I was 18 years old, my freshman year here, we go to uh, Hawaii to play uh, at SMU in the, in the Aloha Bowl. And uh, I get off the, the bus and I see this big ocean. You know, I grew up in Texas. We got some dirty lakes, but no oceans like that. And, and uh, I was like, oh, my God, you know, I'm going out in this water, right? So I run upstairs and go get in the water. And my boys are on the beach, Tim, Timmy T, come back. I said, Man, these brothers scared of the water. You know, I like to tell people I'm a little bit of an anomaly. I'm a brother who can swim, so <laughs> the water don't scare me. And, um, and I got so far in that water, man, I turned around. My boards were about that big. And now I'm trying to come back, and I'm fighting the waves, and I'm fighting all this, and I got the ugly cry going on. <laughs> and um, I'm thinking about the Jaws movies and all that stuff. And when I got about 10 yards from the, from the, from the shore, from the beach, uh, my boys came in and pulled me out. And while I was laying on that beach at 18 years old, what was dropped in my spirit is just like you almost got too far out in the water, naturally so, spiritually you can get too far out there, you can't get back. And at 18 years old, I didn't know what that meant. I had no clue what that meant. But, you know, there were times here at Notre Dame where that, that, would, that would always come back to me. Certainly when I got in, in my pro career, one particular time, um, I got this, uh, I'm going to date myself here, but I, I see some people, other people with gray hair, so you'll know what I'm talking about. Thank you, brother. Um, I had a beeper, man, you know, and in L.A., if you got a beep that said 32 dot, 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 that means you got to call Magic Johnson's people. And I did this particular time, and I got all the information about where the party was going to be, and um, went to the door, opened the door, and what I saw, I was automatically reminded of what happened to me when I was 18. And I used to tell people, I was a dancer, but I couldn't dance like Michael Jackson, but I tried to do his best uh, moonwalk and just moonwalk right on back out that room. And a couple months later, you know, the, the announcement of all announcements when it comes to sports happened when Magic Johnson made that announcement. And I, pr I played 17 years in the NFL. The only time a practice was canceled, it was canceled because we had so many guys who went in that room and participated that we couldn't practice. And, uh, and we had to counsel our practice as a Raider, not as a basketball team. So, you know, so I have always been reminded of my faith and what I should do and what I shouldn't do. And, uh, and just trying not to get so far out there that I can't get back uh, to a place to serve him. And um, so, you know, look, you know, the NFL takes you way out there sometimes. And you got to be really careful about what you do and how you do it. But thankfully, you know, I had a mom and dad that, you know, just didn't care about this football thing. They just didn't. I mean, you know, of course, my dad would brag to his boys, but when he was around me, it, was, it wasn't like this. I bought this brother a brand-new truck, take him home, and he was like, man, thank you for the truck. Can you go take the trash out? I was like, bro, can I get a break? Can I get a little bit of a break? You know, my mom, you know, when I win the Heisman rookie year, I, I, I'm in the, uh, in the um, Pro Bowl. You know, I come home, there's a big sign outside the house that says, Welcome home, Heisman Trophy winner, Pro Bowler Tim Brown. And my mom meets me on the porch. She was like, You see the sign outside? I was like, Yeah, you know, of course I see the sign. You know, she was like, oh, We're so proud of you. I'm like, I know you are proud of me. You know what I mean? It's what I'm saying under my breath anyway. And, and uh, she was like, you, you, you know why the sign is outside? I said, No. She said, Because all of this is going to stay outside of my house. <laughs> and when you come in my house, you're not going to be that person. So I went from my chest being out to, yes, ma'am. And that's basically who I've been ever since. One more question here. You and Davey O'Brien share a special bond. Were you ever able to meet him, and how did that go? No, I wasn't. He passed in, in the late 70s, I believe. And um, Davey O'Brien and I went to the same high school in Dallas, Texas, and we are the only uh, public high school to have two Heisman Trophy winners at Woodrow Wilson High School in Dallas. Uh, but his son, Davey O'Brien Jr., literally, if 
5758 looks just like him. Uh, so Dave and I do a lot of things together in Dallas in regards to Woodrow Wilson. And um, uh, we have the, the, they named the football field, the Davey O'Brien, Brian, Tim Brown football field. So, uh, so I get a chance to see him quite a few times a year. Yeah. Tim, before I let you go here, top 10 matchup tomorrow. We've seen mm -hmm. the Irish look really, really good. We've seen them look mm -hmm. a little shaky at times. What are your thoughts on tomorrow's game? Look, I mean, I, I think this team has risen to the occasion when they need to, when they need to rise. And, um, you know, they sort of played down to the level of people, and then they make plays and win football games. So, um, you know, my son was asking me, you know, are we going to lose this game? <laughs> What's the deal? You know, I, I, I think this is a game that, uh, that's been on the radar. I mean, I had a conversation with Coach Kelly when we brought Timmy up. Uh, a couple of weeks before, three weeks before the season started, this was a game that he was talking about. So uh, this is a game that's on the radar, and I think uh, it's going to be a well-played game by both teams. And um, somebody's going to make a play or two, and I certainly hope that uh, it's the blue and gold that's making that those plays and, uh, and coming out with this big win. Tim, thank you so much for the time. Everybody, right, the 1987 Heisman Trophy winner, Tim Brown. <laughs>